I want to talk to you today about Kantian ethics. Kant develops his ethics, if we remember right, is a deontological theory of ethics where the action is what's important regardless of the consequences. Uh, he calls it deontology. Again, within the word deontology, a Greek word is a root Greek word, deontos, which means duty. So doing the right thing regardless of the consequences of your action is called your moral duty. It's the right thing to do just because it's simply the right thing to do. To formulate Kant's theory of ethics, he deals with what he calls imperatives. Now, the word imperative means something that is very important to do. It's imperative that you show up on time if you want a full hour to take your test. It's imperative that you study 20 minutes a day if you want to do well on these tests. Imperatives are things that we should do. They're very important that we do. It's imperative that we do them. Now, to develop Kant's theory of ethics, his imperatives come in two flavors. The first one is called a hypothetical imperative. Now, a hypothetical imperative is always based on personal desires. For example, let's say I want to go to the movies and I don't want to go alone. I call up a friend of mine. I say, listen, I want to go to the movies tonight. I want to see such and such a movie. Do you want to go with me? And my friend says, yeah, I've been wanting to see that movie too. Which show do you want to go to? I said, the 7 o'clock show. He says, okay, I'll meet you there. I said, for sure you're going to meet me there, right? Don't, don't not show up. No, no, I'm going to meet you there. So we make an agreement. It's based on our desire mutually to see the same movie. I show up to the movie and he doesn't show up. I want to see the movie, so I go and see the movie, and after the movie's over, I give him a call, and I say, what happened? Did your car break down or something? He says, no, so-and-so called me up, I decided to go out and have a couple of beers. Now, in Kant's world, ethics depends on moral duty, what we have to do regardless of any other consequences. In Kant's world, if you agree to an imperative, you must keep your imperative. Let me say that for you again. If you agree to do something, you must do it. You cannot allow something else to get in the way. Now, in Kant's world, you don't have to agree to do anything. That's one of the nice things of Kant's world. But if you agree to do something, you must do it. Almost all things we agree to do are what he calls hypothetical imperatives. They're not the universal laws, the laws that we all agree to, like red light, green light, no robbing, stealing, raping, cheating, things like that. Most of the things we do are based on desires. But if we agree to do it in Kant's world, we must do it because it's a duty that we have. Your word is your bond. In the old days, we used to have a handshake. If it was witnessed by one other person, what was established in the, in the, in the, in the face of two or three witnesses became law. We didn't need paperwork. We didn't need all these lawyers. Your word was your bond. And that's basically what an imperative is about. Imperatives are based on desires. We call them hypothetical. And if we agree to do them, we must keep them. It's our duty to keep our word to do what we agree is the right thing to do. Now, there's only one way to not keep a hypothetical imperative after you've made it, and that's if there are extenuating circumstances. Now, what do I mean by extenuating? Extenuating literally means something beyond my control. Uh, I agree, my friend calls me up, the table is reversed, do I want to go to the movie? Yeah, I want to go to the movie, what time, seven o'clock? Okay, be there, I don't want to go alone. No, I'll be there, no problem. And then at 10 to seven, my child starts throwing up blood, and I go to the hospital with him. His throwing up blood is beyond my control. It's not, well, so-and-so called me, I decided to go out and have a few beers. Extenuating circumstances are greater imperatives. It's imperative that I don't let my boy throw up blood and possibly bleed to death. So I take him to the hospital, and I do not keep my initial imperative to go to the movies with my friend. So only under extenuating circumstances can we violate a hypothetical imperative. Don't forget, for Kant, imperatives are based on duty. It's your moral duty. It's an obligation. If you give your word, you keep your word. You don't have to give your word. But if you give your word, you need to keep your word. So think through what you're doing. And if you decide it's something you want to do, then make sure you follow through. It's not very difficult at all. Now, there's another flavor of imperatives for Kant. And this is called categorical imperatives. Categorical imperatives for Kant are the law. These are the things that we all agree are important for us to do in a social setting. Again, no robbing, stealing, raping, embezzling. All of those things that society feels are dysfunctional to the general welfare of society should not be done. Categorical imperatives are law, and the law must be kept. There are no extenuating circumstances for it. If as a society we say it's the right thing to do, then we must keep the law. 
there's absolutely no wiggle room in Khan's world for not keeping the law. Uh, basically, this is how he forms his theory of ethics, hypothetical imperatives, categorical imperatives. I'm going to expound on this a little bit later in another broadcast, but for now, you need to know that Kant formulates his deontological ethics, his moral duty ethics, based on imperatives, things you have to do, hypotheticals, which are what we do most of the time. They're almost always based on desires. And then categorical imperatives that literally act like the law. You must follow the law for the general welfare of society. It becomes your moral duty.